All right, welcome back, everyone. I am Ed Gray, the toaster guy, um, and we are here for this session, um, which will be focusing on discovery gateways and the SSH Open Marketplace. I'm really pleased to be moderating this. Uh, I think it'll be a really interesting panel session and discussion uh, that focuses on the different ways that we can use discovery gateways and, and help different researchers and move forward. Um, so to give you an idea of the agenda, I will give a short introduction to situate this panel in the context of the shock project and what we'll talk about. And then each of uh, my comrades will come up and I will introduce them and they will ex explain their different platform. And then we'll have a, a long panel discussion. And just as a reminder, we have some pre-planned questions, but of course you can raise your hand if you're in the room or submit a question via the online platform as we did in the previous panel. Um, and then we'll have a, a quick wrap up at the end. Everyone okay with that? Good. So, um, as, as we come into this, uh, we, we have to keep in mind that of the, the shock projects, I think 34, 35 different key exploitable results. Uh, one of the, the largest is the SSH Open Marketplace, which you can find, of course, at marketplace.sshopencloud.eu. Um, and this is a discovery platform that curates and contextualizes tools and services for SSH researchers by linking them with related publications, data sets, training materials, and workflows. This is not the first discovery platform for tools. Um, those of you that have been around in this business for a while know it is, it is just a, another in a, a long series. So why? Why did we do this? Well, I mean, we, we, we looked at the lessons of the past, and especially in terms of sustainability, in terms of curation, and we wanted to make sure that we could move forward and make something that is useful. Um, we did not put all of this work together just to have it fall apart in flames within a couple years. Um, and, and I think what's really interesting about this panel is that we'll bring together the experts, um, including some of my friends that I've worked with for quite some time in the Shock Project, um, and we'll discuss the SSG Marketplace, how it came together, how it in, in handles certain important questions, such as how do you engage with your users? How do you get them to come in? Also, how do you handle curation of data? How do we make sure the data and, and the discovery platform's up to date? And how do we make sure this is sustainable and that it will keep running for several different years? Um, and we'll put this in context with other discovery platforms such as the EOSC portal, such as Europeana and so on and so forth. Um, so here you can see the, the lovely panel that we've assembled. Um, I wanted to, to really just start here and introduce this session and, and now it is, is my real pleasure to turn it over to um, the, the different speakers we've invited. So the first will be Mete Durko. Um, he's been instrumental to the conception and growth of the ACDHCH, uh, which is the Austrian um, Digital Humanities Network, founded in 2015. And in his role as the ACDHCH Technical Group, uh, he's the head. He's been coordinating the development of applications and the provision of services for numerous projects of the Institute and its cooperating partners. And I can say I've worked uh, quite a bit with Mate in a Daria context as well as in shock, and it's been a real pleasure. So it is my pleasure to welcome Mate to the floor. Come on up. Uh, yeah, so hello also from my side and thank you. Thank you, Ed, for the kind words. Uh, this uh, feeling is quite mutual. It was a lot of fun and pleasure to work with you. Um, and I'm really, um, well, first of all, I have to say, I actually, after the eloquent eulogy from, <laughs> from Ed before, uh, I could actually rest my case, I would say. He already uh, gave the argument, uh, but I won't let you get out of it so easily. We spent three years on this, so <laughs> you will bear with me now a few minutes. Um, and, but I'm really very happy um, to be at this point, as, we, as also Ivana said, that uh, we started at some point and now we are uh, three years later and really can present stuff that we thought out we will we will work on um, or develop uh, and I'm quite um, yeah happy is the, probably the easiest word uh, that we that we managed and produced um, this or uh, really came to a uh, functioning and I think quite a nice uh, result here in the in the marketplace um, so let me okay you saw this one uh, I guess I won't repeat it again. Um, uh, so what is the marketplace? Again, I feel like I have to, well, I will summarize what Ed says basically. Um, uh, so it's a discovery portal for SSH resources. 
Um, so it's not the repository. There is no data stored uh, uh, in, in the marketplace. It's, it's a catalog, basically, of different kind of, of resources um, or research outputs, if you wish. But it's less on the, the focus on the, res on the output, but on the kind of as an input for further research, right? So the, the idea we had in mind is, or the question we had in mind, how to help the researcher to do their research. Um, and so uh, the material that we were collecting should yeah, help, help you to, um, uh, yeah, to do your research. Um, and uh, so the, the th uh, kinds of resources we have uh, we are collecting is uh, tools and services, uh, training materials, workflows, data sets and publications. And um, we have like the three C's as the guiding principles for developing the marketplace and, and uh, maintaining it, using it. And that would be the contextualization, curation and community. Um, contextualization is um, the idea of, of interlinking and relating the different items. So it's not just a list of things, but it's more of a, well, today we would talk about knowledge graph or, uh, yeah, so interlinked, interlinked uh, information, right? Uh, so that you can also find, for example, the training materials that go with a tool. I mean, but again, you already saw it nicely in Ed's uh, presentation. Um, the other is, and we already heard it's about the importance of this uh, also in the previous uh, talks, the curation, the, the ongoing curation, the quality of the metadata is crucial for uptake and usage, uh, and I believe that I, um, yeah, as we heard, there is, uh, have been a lot of attempts on, on um, uh, registries and, and catalogs, um, and many of them have, are in oblivion. Um, uh, and I believe that the value of such catalogs grows with their uh, age plus curation. So they have to be, so, so the, the older they get and, and still are being curated, so the information kind of accumulates there and, and, uh, um, but it, and is kept up to date, uh, the more of, of, of the more value they are for, uh, for the user. Uh, and the third, the user, is the community. Uh, so we really put a lot of effort and or focus or emphasis on uh, allowing to the community or in, in, um, including or involving actively uh, the community or the users and allowing them to contribute actively to the, uh, to the system while not just relying on that because we learned that from the past that uh, while there may be a surge of interest from the community for such things, it, it is mostly short-lived. So we kind of try to balance here uh, on, the, on the question of the curation uh, between a kind of a central committee, or well, let's call it differently, uh, a moderator's team um, uh, that is really kind of dedicated and paid for making, sh ensuring the quality of it, uh, but uh, also allowing for contributions from the broader audience and mixing these two uh, uh, curation efforts, if you wish. Okay. Um, as a catalog, basically, uh, the, the most of the information uh, in the marketplace is sourced from different other existing uh, places, um, which are mostly of, for, uh, specific for a specific kind of, of resource, so either for training materials or for tools, uh, and may also be endangered already or on the verge of deprecation. Uh, so that was also one of the arguments or reasons which uh, uh, kind of to prioritize individual sources. Uh, currently we have 10 different sources, for example, programming historian or the, um, the registry of the tools, TAPOR, so-called, uh, the training uh, materials uh, from Daria campus uh, and more. Um, Um, there is also the, but uh, as an extra, this an automatic uh, ingestion. So where we have automated ingestion pipelines, which we also can run, so we can synchronize with these sources uh, uh, continuously. Uh, but next to that, we have also the op opportunity to enter manually items, uh, new items, or suggest new items and edit those. So the idea in general is we collect whatever we get, 
uh, and then we try to curate on our side. So we have complex or well, well-established <laughs> curation workflows, uh, procedures inside, and the uh, machinery for that to allow a uh, ongoing quality improvement, hopefully. Um, and uh, yeah, and one aspect also, and uh, we had talked about. Uh, so one of the types of the, uh, entities we have is, is publications. Uh, and what we find is important added value for the user then would be to, for example, find the publications that mention the g given tool so that I can see how at the tool or, yeah, let's say tool, uh, was actually used in a training material. Uh, in, it was mentioned or in a, uh, was used in a research and mentioned in a, in a pu publication. Um, and so the one kind of kind type of activities we do in the background is trying to extract relations from publications and then enter them, ingest them as uh, additional contextualization in the marketplace. Um, this is an example of our uh, favorite, uh, <laughs> right from the start, uh, tool, Gephi. Um, and you see some description, you see the, I can probably cannot point, can I point? No, can I? Yeah, I can. Uh, the link to the original, uh, information and uh, curated metadata structured. Uh, so for example, information about for which kind of activities is one of our primary indexes to, and to search for the information is which kind of research activities you could do, um, licensing and so on. And also the kind of provenance information, where does it come from, etc. And uh, okay, this was the wrong one, this is the right one. And this is again, we saw it, the relations. Um, so that would be links to other items in the uh, marketplace that are related and these are manually kind of curated uh, quality approved so it's not like just uh, amazon so people uh, like recommend automatic recommendation but these are uh, hand uh, picked so to say okay and that's that's all from my side thank you <laughs>Thanks very much, Ed. I'm delighted to be here, although I need to keep pinching myself that I'm not actually dreaming. I'm here in front of uh, all you and not in front of a screen. It's great. Um, okay, so yeah, I'm here to talk a little bit about the EOSCA portal and the context of uh, uh, this discussion. Um, before I introduce the portal, I'd just like to say a few words about um, the EOSCA Future Project. And um, this is the, the project which uh, leads the current production implementation uh, of EOSC. It uh, coordinates across uh, about 21 current projects which are somewhat related to EOSC. So these include the user community projects, including, of course, uh, shock thematic projects, projects that are building um, the EOSC governance and the regional levels as well, and delivering services by the e-infrastructures as well. And this is really where I come from. I'm a, another e-infrastructure guy from uh, EGI. Within the EOSC uh, Future Project, I lead the work behind the service management system. So again, service delivery. I'm also involved in onboarding of services uh, to EOSC and, and some other bits and bobs. So um, first of all, I'd like to really show you this picture. Don't worry, I'm not going to go into too much detail. I think it really is quite helpful to get an idea of the architecture um, of EOSC. So we have three main parts here, the, the core, the exchange, and the EOSC interoperability framework. Uh, so uh, first of all, 
uh, we have the EOSC core. So these are the services that are required to operate the EOSC. So includes the portal, not only the resource catalogue, the provider portal, which is used for onboarding resources, federated authentication and authorization infrastructure, monitoring, accounting, help desk, security coordination, all of the things that you'd expect to be there, but are not necessarily visible to the end user, with some exceptions, of course, Help desk is very much for user-facing service. Then we've got the EOSC interoperability uh, framework. So um, the, this is the framework which is really um, there to provide uh, uh, the guidelines uh, to provide us how to connect the services to the EOSC exchange um, and the EOSC core. Um, in the future, uh, we expect the interoperability framework to help out actually linking services with data and also helping to compose services together. Uh, but this is a little bit along the lines and probably won't happen um, in EOSC future. And then we've got the exchange. So what's the exchange? The exchange are all of the resources, the services that have been onboarded um, and registered to EOSC to serve the actual users. So we can have the uh, services coming from a, a wide range of different uh, places. It could be cluster community, regional, commercial services as well, um, also infrastructure services. Uh, also data, uh, but via the repositories themselves that have been onboarded. Hopefully this gives you a little bit of an uh, idea of the background of all this. And then we come to the actual portal itself, which can be accessed by eosportal.eu. You can think of this almost like a Swiss army knife. Uh, it does an awful lot of things in one place. It's the gateway for information about the EOSC. It serves the end users, enabling them to discover resources. And by resources, you can think of services. Um, once they've found a, a resource that they're interested in, they can then um, use it via uh, going to it via link or ordering it. Um, if it's a depletable resource, that you need to actually specify how much of that resource should be, maybe X virtual machines, and then that gets forwarded via the portal to the supplier of that service. Um, access and also compose as well, so you can actually make use of multiple resources, and if you have the know-how to actually bring them together for your user communities. Users aren't the only users of the portal. We have the service providers as well. They can make use of the portal to actually upload their resources um, and then use the portal to discover um, new users or have new users discover their services and grow their user community um, and also integrate with the core. So if uh, service providers don't have, for example, an AAI infrastructure, they can onboard their service and then integrate with the AAI, with the help desk, etc. Hopefully that's given you a little bit of an idea of what the EOSC portal is all about. Just to say a few more words about some specific services behind the portal. There's the, the marketplace, which is where you can search for uh, resources. Uh, we've currently got um, upwards of 200 providers, up almost 300 resources, a good number of communities and infrastructures behind this. Uh, and also we've defined some target groups as well to help the usage uh, of the marketplace. And that's it. That's my very quick introduction to the portal. So thank you. All right. Thank you very much, Matt. And next, we have the pleasure of welcoming Yannick Legre uh, from Operas. Yannick Legre is the Secretary General of Operas and has a senior consultant for various European small and middle enterprises. Formerly, he was the director of the EGI.EU until December 2019 and a senior research engineer at the French National Scientific Research Center, or CNRS, uh, and Cloud Institute. He holds a Master of Science in Information Technology and a degree in law. Over the last 20 plus years, Yannick has been involved in more than 60 projects in the areas of e-infrastructures, healthcare, and biomedical research, as well as biodiversity and environmental research. Yannick has successfully coordinated several EC, NATO, and nationally funded projects. He has also been a co-founder and president of the International Health Grid Association and the director for international relations of a French small and middle enterprise. Yannick is also a certified expert and auditor for FIT SM standard and ISO EIC 27001. Yannick. Thank you, Ed. That looks very serious. 
so as Ed is the toaster and as you are the researcher, uh, I believe that makes me one of the toast. Uh, so let's start getting toasted. So what I want to present you today uh, is part of the, the triple project, uh, which is funded by the European Commission. So it gathers a consortium of 22 partners for, from 13 countries. And this is still a work in progress because uh, the project will end uh, only in one year. So what I want to present to you is uh, the, the Go Triple platform, uh, which is an innovative multilingual and multicultural discovery uh, solution for so social sciences and, and humanities. So it is truly a single access point uh, that allows to explore, find, access and reuse material such as uh, literature data project and also research, uh, researcher profiles at the European scale. So it has been based on, on the Isidore search engine developed by CNRS and it will be in terms of sustainability one of the dedicated services of the Opera's research infrastructure uh, to ensure open scholarly communication in the SSH area. Uh, so, sorry, uh, no, which one is it? That one. Uh, yeah, so j just to uh, to show you that there is three main parts. So uh, you have the, the triple core uh, pipeline uh, that is the, the, the core of, of the platform. Then you have the, the back end to, uh, to treat some of the data and the front end for the user. So I will just now give you some more detail uh, about the, uh, the, the triple core pipeline. Yes, okay, it's online. So the, the triple core pipeline is a general and configurable content acquisition and processing pipeline for uh, publication, uh, data, and, and project. So you have some specialized data connector, uh, but also some data cleaning, cleaning and cementing services to improve metadata quality. And some of these services, for example, is it not working? Oh yeah, sorry, forgot the animation. <sighs> So one of them is the classification. So uh, the classification service is in charge of the discipline enrichment based on the 27 Morris categories. And uh, so far it is available in nine different languages, soon to be 11. And bes beside the classification, we have the annotation, uh, which uh, enrich the metadata initially recorded by the author uh, of the paper and by adding some uh, formalized triple keywords. Uh, and the triple vocabulary, as you can see from the slide, is a multilingual and hierarchical set of about 2,500 different uh, SSH-related concepts in also nine different language and soon to be 11. Uh, so that is uh, really the, one of the enriching services we have for, for metadata. So just if, if I want to, to summarize, uh, what we have for uh, GoTriple is that the platform is focusing mainly uh, for now on, on three different aspects. Uh, the, the publication and data, the profiles uh, of the researcher and the research project. And then uh, the, the project focus on uh, subject specific and multilingual diversity. And it is available for a different set of, of users from the citizen to the researcher, uh, spanning also journalist company, but cities, region, and other actors that are interested in finding resources in multiple languages. And that's it for me. I've been quick. Thank you very much, Yannick. And next, we'll have Valentin Schall from the Europeana Foundation. Valentin has worked with Europeana since 2009, covering the field of data aggregation and quality. She supported the development and adoption of the Europeana data model before coordinating the development of Matisse, the data aggregation and publication infrastructure used at Europeana. She now serves as the data services director. Valentina. Hi everyone, thank you for inviting me, uh, joining you here today, and hi for everyone uh, online as well, we shouldn't uh, forget them. <laughs> uh, so yeah, today I wanted to uh, present uh, the Europeana uh, platform. So in the past, 
uh, 12 years, uh, Europeana and its network has led uh, the cultural heritage uh, sector through the changes that, uh, that have been brought by, uh, by digital uh, technologies. So together, the foundation and the network have um, organized event training for the sector, which resulted in um, building frameworks and standards for the cultural heritage uh, sector, which resulted in bringing together more than uh, 51 million object, digital objects, um, from the from the sector in a 38 language and now all those uh, those materials are available uh, mostly via the europeana.eu website and uh, via um, a series of, uh, of API um, so in terms of, of data so we have a, 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 a diverse collection of data ranging from the different type of, of materials that can be um, uh, collected by museum, libraries, archive, audiovisual archives. Um, as you can see, we have a very little amount of 3D material, which is going to be uh, really the, the target for the, the, coming, uh, the coming years, where there is a, a true impulse from the European Commission to work on uh, more, getting more 3D uh, material from uh, cultural heritage. We are working with uh, materials coming from all over Europe, so our collection, our data set is, uh, is, very, uh, is completely multilingual, and that has been the focus of the work we have been doing in the past two years, really making um, the services offered by Europeana uh, truly multilingual. Um, so, in terms of really data aggregation, data collection, so we are working with uh, more than 4,000 uh, 4, uh, institutions uh, across Europe, and most of these institutions are working with aggregators, which are acting as, a, as hubs um, uh, to, to collect the data, curate the data, enrich the data. So now there are many um, data enrichment, machine learning activities that are done by those aggregators. And then um, all this data is sent to, uh, to Europeana, um, and the data is messaged uh, through the Europeana pipeline and published uh, in, in the website. The collection of the data since uh, a couple of years now is, um, is, has been um, uh, organized a bit better through also uh, data quality requirements. So we have the Yopana publishing uh, framework, which is a system that defines uh, quality criteria for content and for metadata. And this has been a great tool for, for the, the sector to work on uh, data quality, improving data quality so that uh, requirements from the users um, are, are fully uh, fulfilled. So then in terms of services, uh, so the main uh, window to access all this material is of course the, the Europeana uh, website, where now um, we are working very much on allowing users to browse through the collection by offering different type of entry points, which are uh, now uh, focusing more, more on using uh, entities in the data so that the user can really start accessing um, the collection through topics, uh, people, places. So it's providing many different type of, uh, of entry points in the, in the collection. Um, we are also doing a lot of capacity building activities, so really uh, offering trainings, workshops for the sector, and also making the data available, uh, so mostly through, uh, through the, the APIs. So there is a, a series of APIs that can uh, allow you to, uh, to access the data, uh, access the entities, uh, the, the, the entity collection uh, Europeana has, and we try to also develop different ways to access the data. So for example, you can also uh, download the data set if you uh, are not mastering uh, uh, API technology, we also are offering a, a download, and the idea is also to make the data set available in other uh, places, so for example uh, via uh, SOC, where I think the, the data set from Europeana has been registered in the, in the marketplace. Um, I think, yeah, that was it for me. Thank you. <laughs> All right, and last but certainly not least, we have Karsten Thiele. Karsten is the Chief Technical Officer at CESDA, working from its main office in Bergen, Norway. He is responsible for CESDA's technical roadmap and strategy and the infrastructure's interoperability within EOSC, including the Shock Cluster Project, which is coordinated by CESDA. 
He holds a PhD in mathematics, and his research interests include distributed development processes and the DevOps approach to infrastructure management. Karsten, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you, Ant, and good morning, everyone. So I want to talk about data catalogs. Please note there is a plural there, um, because there is more than one catalog in shock. Uh, as we've been saying this morning, it's a number of infrastructures. We saw these numbers, 50 partners. Um, there is not one catalog. Um, we have multiple domains, social sciences, humanities, both in their own right very broad, but also very different disciplines compared to each other. And there are lots of standards that are being used in these communities. Um, some are more established, some are more common, some are very heterogeneous, some are very specialized to very specific types of data, to very specific applications. These data are usually stored in institutional repositories that are run by the, our infrastructures, that are run by institutions that are established, have been around for quite some time. And through our infrastructure approach, we're ensuring that they're being archived, that they're being disseminated. And two of the guiding principles here are the FAIR principles um, for design and interoperability, making sure that it's sustainable, it's findable, uh, you can access it, it's interoperable and reusable. Um, and the Core Trust seal as a standard for certifying repositories, uh, more on the sustainability of those, and making sure that the data will be available for quite some time, independent of what the APIs will be that we'll be using in a decade or in centuries, as we heard earlier today, um, for actually finding them. So how does this relate to the EOSC landscape? Well, we heard earlier there's the SSH Open Marketplace, which is not a data catalog. Matei showed us the number of uh, things we have from the different categories and the data was actually pretty small. That's because it's usually used when it comes to the uh, connection and relation with others, uh, with other types of data, for instance, with the software, with the tools that we're using. It's the contextualization, one of the big C's Matei was talking about. Our catalogs usually have an institutional basis, whether that's the actual institution holding the data or it's the broader network disseminating the data. We were talking about aggregators already. Um, and these catalogs are usually defined specifically for the domain they're designed for, for the data they hold coming from specific domains. And that's also reflected in the search interfaces that have filters that are very specific to the kind of data that we hold there. And on the other side, there are generic data portals to have uh, as much data as possible in a single place to allow search across a wide variety of data sets, a wide corpus of data making interdisciplinary research possible. But that of course means you have to agree on the metadata standards and I believe many in this room know how hard that can be. Yeah. And also generic data portals, there's not just the academic ones, there are also commercial ones. And uh, there's this one question of what makes us better than Google. Yeah. Um, we're working currently on linking all this to the EOS data portal. We uh, heard Matt talk about the EOS portal, where currently there's a lot of services. Um, and the data portal is something that as, the part of, as part of EOS future is currently being developed and being populated. So this is ongoing work as we speak and beyond and in for shock. So in closing, I think there's, there's two challenges uh, to think about. One is finding the balance between specifically targeting discovery portals at a given community or having a wide variety of data sets. Uh, and this goes back to me saying we have these dedicated repositories for our communities, for specific disciplines, for specific user communities. Um, or we have the big ones. We have Europeana. Um, which is not everything, but very, very broad. Um, or we have the EOS data portal, which is supposed to cover all uh, data from the EOS landscape, and that is a wide variety. And simultaneously, we have to clarify what are they made for, whom are they targeting, and also making sure that users understand where to go depending on what they want to find. Going back to the toasters, there's a variety of them, and not every toaster will give you the toast in the way you want them, but 
it's our job to make sure that researchers understand which toaster to go to and that they're all compatible and that you can actually put your toast in all of them because they are quite interoperable if you think about it. Okay, that's it for me. Thank you. All right, I will ask our panelists to come take a seat up in front of the audience for the... Where's the, um, the slide that has all the questions on it? No. Okay, very good. Um, so we now have time for a panel session. We obviously have some questions prepared ahead of time, but I'd like to ask now, are there any questions from the online audience? Yes, does this work? Yes, great. Yes. Thank you. So there is a question from the online um, uh, audience, which is actually a, qual a clarification question for Mate. And the question is, um, is the SSH open marketplace um, sorry, um, so it's about as the SSH open marketplace and the question is whether it's only for open resources or whether it also index subscription resources. Can you hear me? Yes, okay. Uh, well, it, as a catalog, it's not restricted to, so we take whatever we get, uh, but as, um, it's not focused on, on data sets, so it's not a data catalog, as, as Carsten rightly pointed out. Uh, so, um, if you are looking for restricted data sets, uh, you would anyhow, or any, any data sets, you would, you would primarily go somewhere else, so to say. Yeah. yeah. Uh, another uh, question on the marketplace, which is um, actually related to what you just said. The question is, um, if the SSH Open Marketplace is not a data catalog, how should it be described? Is it an index, a platform, a search engine, a portal? Well, I uh, we well discovery platform or any you you name it. Uh, there are different names for it. Uh, it's a discovery platform or a catalog, but it's not a catalog of data, but of uh, not primarily of data. So, but primarily of tools and services and and things. How you or yeah, the the, the kind of resources I I described um, uh, and with a question of how can I do th do things, and not what are the pieces of data that I would, uh, uh, yeah. So I'm not looking for the data there, primarily. Thank you. All right, any audience questions? Hi, it's Jordi from Panosk and my question is, does the shock marketplace and the EOC marketplace are a duplication of F4, or how they will align over time? What's, what plans do you have out there? I guess I have to answer that one <laughs> as well, because the EOC marketplace is the, is the bigger, big brother, the bigger brother, the biggest brother. Um, uh, yeah, so we, obviously we are thinking of it, of the alignment and uh, exploring it. Well, on a conceptual level, you could say that uh, the shock marketplace, all of the items in the shock marketplace should also appear in the EOS marketplace at some point when it will be not only about services but also about other research products where it is heading. Um, um, but uh, the, the, uh, it still uh, has, set, uh, has um, what, um, there is a reason for have such a specific shock marketplace because it's domain specific and uh, you can do better, as, as Carsten pointed out, you can have a more specific uh, metadata and, and better curation. So you cannot do that kind of curation on the large scale uh, that we do in our, our area. But there is, we are thinking of, of uh, interoperability and of synchronization of information between these two catalogs. Yeah, and if I may add to that, so one of the important activities uh, that's happening within EOSC Future uh, is regarding the interoperability of catalogs um, actually being able to put into place the infrastructure to transfer records, to synchronize records between the catalogs. Uh, as far as the duplication of effort and trying to avoid it, one thing that we need to make sure is that the records in the catalogs are up to date and are reliable. One thing we need to do is to 
add or onboard new information. Another one is to actually audit the existing information to make sure that it's not out of date, that we don't have dead services in these catalogues. One thing we wish to do is to put into place um, the idea of who is responsible for a particular record so we can maybe signify which the the primary record owner is for that record so it's this central catalog within the EOS portal or maybe it's the shop marketplace so hopefully by doing this we will avoid uh, duplication of effort Yes. So if I can jump in as well, I wanted to add that another of the differences between the EOSC marketplace and the shock marketplace is that in the EOSC marketplace, there has to have a certain TRL or technological readiness level to get in. And you also have to have, as you said, in terms of responsibility, having this you know, unit, this institution that is legally responsible for it. Whereas in the marketplace, using the, the various login factors, anyone can log in and propose things. We can also add in, you know, little bits of orphaned code that may still be useful for folks, but would never reach the sort of technological maturity to get into the OSC marketplace. So there is sort of a, anything that is marked as SSH in the marketplace gets ingested into the shock SSH open marketplace, but the EOSC remains this sort of higher barrier to entry, but that has the disadvantage of being more exclusionary, which is where the SSH open marketplace comes in because we are more focused and specialized on the discipline-specific methods. Therefore, we can allow things that are a little bit less perfect um, because we have more of the, the researchers and the engineers in the terrain that know and can value whether this is a good thing and can keep up with the curation and moderation. Um, my question is very similar to the previous one, but actually it involves triple <laughs> as well. Um, and I'm wondering, uh, uh, following from this uh, conversation, um, how much coordination is already in place between, between the three tools? Um, and whether you have actually thought how we're going to have some sort of guiding system for researchers to be able to signal to them for which types of uses that they're going to be looking for certain types of information. And I do very much realize that the types of information, services, tools, publications, these are not the same things that researchers, being a researcher myself, um, these are not the same things and it might be strategic to search for information in different places. But I fear that uh, people will be lost into knowing where to go for what and with what level of maturity as you were just signaling. And I'm also wondering from the perspective of those who are actually onboarding that their information, whether you're essentially going to be asking us <laughs> who are producing projects, uh, publications or um, tools to be onboarding on three different places or ensuring that we signal <laughs> uh, that our tools and services exist to three different places or whether there will be an automated system to ensure that all of the information is, is uh, uh, effectively being available when certain levels of maturity are reached in all of the relevant uh, uh, platforms. So if you have any thoughts about uh, the strategies that you're pursuing already or, or what's the sort of pathway that you're considering that would be very useful. Thanks. I can, I can start uh, answering. Uh, so first of all, uh, you have to, to consider that all the tools are developed within the project framework. So the, the, the effort is, is short term. Uh, but for example, in Triple, we already have uh, most of the uh, S3 project in the SSH area uh, involved in the development of the, the Go Triple platform. Uh, and we are all involved in, in the shock project as well. So definitely there is already some coordination because most of us, if not all, we are also part of the EOSC association and the EOSC effort. So definitely there are some coordination, but the maturity level of the different tools is not yet at the, at the same level as Ed uh, pointed. And there is still some work to be done to, to be able to integrate. Uh, as you mentioned also, we are not dealing exactly with the same type of, of resources. Uh, and so the integration may take longer. For example, uh, one of the emphases we, we put in Triple also is the multilingualism. Uh, so far, EOSC is only dealing with English as a lingua franca. 
Uh, so probably it would be nice also to, that we export some of the, the tool and methodology that we develop in the, in the SSH for, for enriching EOSC and allowing them to, to search in, in uh, uh, different languages. Uh, but yeah, definitely that there is some coordination. This is, this is the point uh, of the uh, shock cluster uh, to allow us to, to align our strategy. Uh, as Opera's research infrastructure, we will sustain the GoTriple platform because our main objective is the open scholarly communication. And so we want to offer the researcher that kind of tool. And if we have to integrate it in, in some other uh, tools, then uh, we are happy to, to contribute and work on that. Uh, I hope it answers partly your question. I don't know if my colleagues want to add anything. Yeah, one thing I'd like to add is something that actually helps us here is something called the rules of participation. Now, this is an output, quite a high-level output of the rules of participation task force, which is NEOS task force, um, and it really gives guidelines about who should or what should be included um, in these different catalogs. But they are open to interpretation, right? Uh, within the EOSC uh, portal, uh, we, for example, only accept um, um, English language uh, descriptions of services, TRL level 8. We need there to be a privacy policy in place, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, but that is not the case for all of the different catalogs. So that needs to impose some restrictions in terms of uh, the uh, synchronization of records, but it, of course, doesn't mean to say that your catalogue cannot have a lower rules of participation. Yeah, maybe just to add, so we know of each other, and, and but yes, uh, so kind of there were different developments, uh, individual projects, and uh, the coordination. We talk to each other, and I think now that we have or each of these efforts have their there are overlaps on semantic conceptual level and technical but on the other hand there is also always some specific distinctive requirements that motivated develop these developments uh, but I feel like now that we have this baseline uh, the for me the new phase is opening with the EOS EOS future where the integration on the next level can happen. Uh, and, and, and so we're working on that, on this really synchronization. So we definitely will avoid that anybody has to enter or submit their information or service three times. So, so exactly that has to happen on the technical level. We are aware of that and working on it in the kind of follow-up projects. If I can just add something. For, for, for Triple, uh, you don't have to submit anything. We are harvesting. So that's already... So, something that you don't have to do. <laughs> All right, thank you so much for this question. I think it sort of leads into one of the panel discussions we had planned, which was asking how do your portals relate to one another and, and how do they work together if, if they do. Uh, would any of the other panelists like to, to add something to sort of take this into a broader discussion and take us out of the specific shock kiosk triple platform framework? Yeah, maybe um, thinking back on the data catalogs and uh, similar what uh, Janin just said with the harvesting. I mean, we do this also within the ERICs, for instance, right? Um, Clarin has the VLO, which shows you all the data from uh, all the Clarin centers. Uh, Daria has the easy door and generic search engines to give you that. Uh, in SESTA, we have the SESTA data catalog that harvests from all of our national uh, nodes. And what we are trying to do is to push this then forward to, for instance, EOS, to triple, et cetera, to make sure that this data gets there, taking care of the conversion process in between so that our archives uh, can take care of taking on the data, describing it as best as they can with the domain knowledge that they have of understanding where the researcher comes from, um, and then us going through these processes automated usually to make it more generic and interoperable and bring it to these broader uh, catalogs and portals. Okay, all good? Uh, I would have a question for, for maybe for Valentin or, yep. yeah, uh, because, um, yeah, so I'm wondering uh, how we, we want to, regarding the cooperation, and so when you look at, the, on the one side you have open air and EOSC data and, and the EOSC ecosystem of catalogs, let's say, which are uh, more on, on services and research outputs, and on this, if I can simplify like that, that on Europeana is more with on, on cultural heritage data or 
or digital digital objects. Um, uh, so, and, and I'm wondering if we can, if you can, if you can draw this line so distinctly, or because when I think of our my background in our institute, I mean, if I have a uh, his project of a, like a literary digital edition, and then I have some images of the historical material that are coming from the library, that would actually go into Europeana, but then in the project, the TI, so there was some processing of the data of the original material, and I have at the end, let's say, a TEI with some rich annotation, which would be a research output. And so the question to Valentin is, would you care for the TEI as well, uh, from Europeana point of view, or...? <laughs> yeah, so I think the, the approach that Europeana took, and this is quite... I would say it's quite recent, where we, we do now look much more uh, uh, at the users, you know, the user needs um, from the user perspective. So I think now this is very much, much more leading than what we are getting in. So I would say if the TEI allows us to support a requirement from a user, you know, I don't know if it's about uh, offering full text on, on materials that otherwise uh, people wouldn't be able to understand, then it supports a, a, a user use case. So then you could say, well, yeah, let's let's start to, to, to look at this. But I would say if the research output would be something very specific that is not really serving um, a need from a user, we, yeah, you could d argue like, why, why would we do it? So, so yeah, I think it's uh, it, it has been the big change in in Europeana is it has been to really look much more about user interactions, uh, what, what what people need. So of course we have to cater different type of uh, of users. So uh, from the main Europeana website, yeah, it's more the, the European citizen. Uh, then you could say well also. Um, Researchers are also an audience, so there might be also some more specific uh, se specific needs. But I would say, yeah, the, the the thought process would go more in this way to really try, okay, what kind of problems can we solve by getting this data in, you know, and then that would justify whether it's worth the effort uh, or, or not. Um, Thank yeah. you. Well, I like this user-oriented approach. That's. And it actually leads to one of the discussions which we wanted to have as well, and it's a fantastic transition. So thank you both, Mette and Valentin, which is, you know, who are your users? How do your platforms engage and reach out to your user communities? Um, how, how, how do you approach this user question? Because as I, I, I tried to, to point uh, across other than to call you all toasters, um, it's, it's very important to reach the users and the researchers where they are. Um, so how do your different platforms do this? <laughs> Yeah, well, I, I, I can start yeah. <laughs> since I have the, the mic. So, yeah, I would say there are different approach um, in terms of, uh, you know, if you have a website, yeah, probably what you will try to do is really gathering information from your users. So, you know, using surveys, uh, that, that, that kind of tools to, to try to get information, what are the topics people are interested in, etc. And then another approach which Yopana took is really to, to be a bit more community specific. So for example, in, in the past two years, we have worked a lot with uh, educators. So we are really relying on, on networks of educators across Europe. And then they are really doing hands-on activities, you know, with, with teachers, with students. So maybe in terms of scale, it's, it's quite small scale, but you know, it's what brings the, the usage of the, of the data. So uh, recently there was this project uh, called uh, Built with Bits, where basically it's educators, they built with students virtual environment and they were using objects from Europeana to put in those virtual museum or virtual space they had created. So it was really, yeah, directly going to, to teachers with their students and then they were exploring, you know, how how the kids interact with uh, those kind of technologies, and also doing also a bit of study, um, you know, the fact that VR is good, but apparently kids, after a certain uh, amount of hours playing with this, you know, they could feel like the attention from the students was going down, so it also gave indication, you know, for, for teaching methods, you know, where 
uh, where VR is good and where it stops, etc. So there is also this very much community-driven approach where you go directly, yeah, indeed, where your users uh, are. Um, yeah. So j just for us, uh, I will only focus on the on the Go Triple platform, which are, which is our discovery platform, because we have other services with different kind of audience. Uh, for, for for Go Triple, so of course, researcher are one of our uh, audience, uh, and we go through, I would say, standard communication uh, in in different uh, project in the communities, but also word of mouth. But as, as I mentioned in my slide, uh, we are also targeting uh, the citizen uh, because we value very much uh, citizen science and the contribution of, of citizens uh, and also more uh, professional or institutional uh, customers. So uh, with respect to the citizen uh, involvement, we have uh, very recently set up also uh, some uh, crowdfunding mechanism to try to put also more in contact researcher and, and citizen that may be interested in some topic to, to start funding some very innovative uh, or more risky uh, seed project. So th this is also some of the mechanism we, we set in, in place. Uh, from the point of view of EOSC Future, the coordinator of EOSC, I think there are two distinctive types of users that we need to consider. There are the researchers, there are the end users, the scientists. And I think to some extent, we reach out to those via the communities, via yourselves, who are interacting with EOS. You guys know your users. You guys know the kind of vocabulary that makes sense to your users, so we rely on those. The other type of users, however, for us, the coordinators, are the service providers, the service suppliers. We need to consider those as users as well. Those are the users of the core services that I mentioned earlier on. And we need to make sure that you guys know what the, um, the advantages of making use of the help desk, the accounting, the monitoring, etc., are. But these are very distinctive use cases from the researchers. Yeah, so for the marketplace, I mean, as we set out uh, developing it, uh, it was, yeah, the uh, SSH researcher, so to say, uh, was the audience we were working towards. Um, uh, we need to see now in practice how it, if we really will be able to uh, attract them. Uh, what we tried to do definitely already during the development, uh, as soon as possible, started to involve uh, external persons, uh, researchers, and uh, also already in the design phase and then also in the implementation phase as uh, early testers uh, to give us feedback. So, uh, so they're also trying to communicate or, or ensure that what we are de developing uh, serves the, the needs. Um, yeah, and then uh, now uh, we are trying to spread the word through all kinds of uh, means and also what Valentin said, uh, I very much like the, yeah, like a small scale, uh, really intensive hands-on workshops or all kinds of events uh, on, on, of this kind uh, where people, we, one can engage with, rather it, it doesn't have to be a thousand people, it could be 10 or 15, but you get a, and also multiplier effect, but, but those 10 and 15 can engage with the platform more intensively, can ask questions and you kind of establish uh, communication uh, yeah, so, so I would, that would be our uh, strategy also for the next time to come to spread the word. Yeah, when it comes to the data catalog, I mentioned it uh, very often they're institutional and specifically speaking from my experience in SESTA, we have one national node per country. Some of them are dedicated to social sciences. Some of them have much broader missions to collect all data. Sometimes it's even mandatory for all students to deliver their data that they create for their master's thesis and so on to these centers. And what I've realized is when explaining to people what I do, and in particular people not working in research, um, it's really hard to explain what an infrastructure is. Um, but most of them have actually heard of these national nodes, in particular in Norway, our national node is very known because there is actually a mandate for all the students to deliver their data to them in Norway. And that's why just about everybody knows of that institution. And uh, this is something we've also now realized that there is, as I mentioned, this perspective of taking the data, bringing it forward to the broader and broader and broader catalogs, but we, what we're currently working on is also taking it 
bringing it all the way back again so that uh, if you're performing your search in the Norwegian catalog, it, you don't have to then go to the SESTA catalog and see if there's something maybe also in Sweden, but that the national catalog in Norway will even tell you, oh, by the way, we found these five additional results in the Centre SESTA catalog and they're from Sweden uh, or from Germany or wherever, and you can go there and find them as well. Um, but what we've seen is that this local connection is, uh, is very strong and even when it's not mandated, usually these national centers, the main specific data centers are well known in the respective research communities in the country. Any reactions among the panel, among the audience? Very good. Um, so I think a, a next potential question that, that's really interesting to answer there, is... There's actually a question from oh. the chat, maybe, to um, We to can allow the chat, our, yes. To our online audience. And I think it relates a little bit to the, the question what the, users, uh, what the user wants. So the question is whether it's for the SSH open marketplace, but I think it might relate to the other tools as well. So the question is whether it's possible for researchers to rate different tools and services to comment how they use them in a specific research area or to propose improvements on training materials or other materials. And if this is not the case, whether this is something you consider to develop. So maybe, um, maybe Mathieu can comment and maybe interesting also to see what the other catalogs think. Somewhat reluctantly, I can comment on this because <laughs> it's a bit of a difficult issue. I mean, we obviously considered it. Uh, we discussed it a lot, uh, exactly this kind of um, uh, feedback uh, from the users. Um, for the moment, we decided against it. Uh, so what users can do is uh, contribute in the sense of uh, correcting, correcting or suggesting addition changes to existing information, um, uh, but uh, we felt like uh, a Amazon style uh, stars or so. So we didn't come to a workable solution uh, regarding this uh, reviewing uh, of the com uh, through the communities. Uh, yeah, so not at the moment. We considered um, having comments, and then we decided, nah, nah, <laughs> no, <laughs> no. Uh, uh, so far, uh, as I said, the Go Triple is still under development, so it's still in beta. Uh, so we, we don't allow comments yet because there will be too many, uh, or too little. <laughs> or too little. <laughs> Uh, but de definitely, uh, the, the continuous service improvement is something that we are putting in place. So we will collect feedback, uh, the form of which is still to be uh, agreed on. Uh, because what we have to do is that we all say that services are free at the point of use. But we all know that operating a service has a cost. So it means that someone has to pay for it. And, and this is what we call the customer by opposition to the users. Uh, so we also have to follow uh, the directive and the instruction of the one who are paying for the tools being developed. So this is also this uh, institution or this uh, funding authority that we are listening to uh, because <laughs> we, ha we have to do what we, have, what we are to paid for. And of course, uh, we will uh, listen to the comment of, of the users, but yeah, we, we don't have developed the mechanism yet. Uh, yeah, I just want to say, within future, future, uh, the feedback is very, very important. We are putting into place ways, mechanisms of gathering surveys from people who have onboarded services. What do they think of uh, EOSC? Has it met their expectations? What is missing? We know that there is functionality there that people need that is not available yet. Well, having feedback will help us to prioritize. I would like to still add one thing. Uh, so we, we have a uh, at least a, a feedback, yeah, a, a minimal feedback mechanism, right? So there is a report and issue. So you could, uh, through that, is a way to, to communicate to us when you miss something. But to give you insight or one example of our discussions, why or not uh, to implement this is that, for example, that, yeah, so either you have too little or too, too bad com comments, and so you need a moderation. And especially, but we also thought that there are better places for that already. So, for example, when you have a question on how to do something, then you go to Stack Overflow. And we, we are not, 
we we don't want to compete. It makes no sense to try to compete with Stack Overflow in in this wonderful complex procedure. And it's very complex the procedure, right? Because you have replies. Uh, you, like what what do you do with this uh, with this structured discussion, so to say? Uh, as well, when we say have a tool and somebody wants to rate a tool, then it would be better to or has an issue with a tool then rather to go to the Git repository where the tool is hosted and when the developers are actually, I mean, developers may not even know that their tool is mentioned in our marketplace, right? Uh, so, so that is not the ideal place for the communication between the, the parties, so to say. So that would be one argument, why not? Very good, thank you all so much. It appears we have a question in the audience. Thank you. I'm Claire Cliva from Switzerland, humanist scholars and also a member of the task force Kineosk uh, Upscaling Countries. And so I was very interested to listen to the possible links or relationship between shock and EOS because it's one of my questions, of course. And I would like to suggest when I listen to so much important concerns like multilingualism in the EOSC portal. I think as humanist scholars, we can uh, only encourage that because we know that a word, it's not a word. Um, when I'm listening to that, I'm thinking about the 400 people community that are in the different task forces of EOSC, that's something. And among them, we have a certain numbers of humanist scholars in our task force. I think we have, uh, there is also Ellen Slinart, for example, we are maybe on 26 people, four, five in humanities and social sciences, something like that. So I wonder if at a certain point, uh, we could not have um, online or physical gathering with the people engaged in the EOSC task force and belongings to social sciences and humanities. As you know, middle community to discuss all these questions because all these people are at the key uh, point in the different 13 task forces of EOSC. So that could be a suggestion to try to join the continents together. Let's long life to humanities and social sciences, of course. Thank you very much, Claire. Sounds good. <laughs> And I, of course, I'd, I'd, I'd feel obliged to throw this out as working on the curation for the marketplace that once the, the project comes to an end and it is the three Eric's, Sesta, Claren, and Dari that run it, we will be setting up an editorial board. So if there are those of you interested in being a member of the editorial board to help with the matters of curation. Um, Sign up here. Please. <laughs> Work with us. Become a toaster. Um, very good. We'll move on to the next discussion point, one that I, I think is very important because we talked earlier this morning about how important curation is in ensuring that the services are up to date, especially in the, the, the quickly changing field of digital humanities. Um, so for your platforms, how is curation and moderation handled? How do you ensure that data is up to date? I guess uh, uh, in comparison, well, so so I think we have at the moment um, the luxury, I would say, that uh, or or let's say the the focus in the marketplace was more on quality rather than quantity uh, from right from the start, and so um, we are collecting information and and have, well we have a combination and as i said in, in the pre presentation before we have a combination of as much as possible automatic checks automatic procedures uh to to identify potential problems like for example dead links uh or insufficient descriptions uh and then pass this information on to the curation team so there will be an editorial team of or, uh, who can go through these and, and uh, uh, improve them or correct them. So, so what I mean by luxury is we had luxury of, of uh, manual curation, really, which I don't think uh, Europeana or Open Air have because they go for, I mean, they are in the order of some of tens of thousands of millions, tens of millions, tens of millions of records. So, um, yeah, there you have no options. You have to do everything automatic and hope for the best, so to say. Um, I think that um, there are different angles here, whether we're talking about data research objects 
or services. Um, I cannot really speak for the data objects. I know that my open air colleagues uh, could speak at length about how they do curation and modernization. But as far as the services are concerned, uh, we ensure when a new service is added to the catalog that it meets the rules of participation, that the quality is there, that it's TRL level seven, ideally eight or above. But the question is, how do we make sure that that is maintained into the future? Um, we only have a certain amount of, of effort when we're talking about hundreds and hundreds of objects. We can automate some of these checks, for example, if a new service is onboarded, then it's automatically monitored. If it suddenly disappears after six months um, and it stays uh, vanished, there's no ping at the end point, maybe we can contact the person who has been given, uh, who's given the name as the contact for that service. Um, if we don't hear anything for a week, then maybe we can automatically suspend the service so it doesn't suddenly fill up, the marketplace fill up with dead services. These are the kind of checks that we can do, but it is a very manual process as well, uh, and that is difficult. So we have a, a process that is kind of similar to what Matej uh, described. Also, uh, we don't deal with uh, raw data. We are mostly harvesting data from aggregators and some small publishers. And then what we ensure is to, uh, well, curate the, the, the data we, we store and also enrich the, the metadata and, and do that. So we, we keep that up to date. But for, for the rest, uh, it's not our responsibility. We are just harvesting data from, from the aggregators. Looking back at the, the data archives, where this data is coming from, I think there's a lot of work going on there by data stewards, data curators that have been established at archives, at libraries that have been doing this work for quite some time, focusing on standards. and. Um, I always find this funny when talking to tech people when I tell them that, well, the default for storing pictures is a TIFF format, which almost nobody uses these days in practice, but it is the standard long-term archiving format, and for a reason. Uh, and the same goes for all the other standards that we're using there. And this is, um, in, in a way, making it long-term sustainable as good as we can, um, because the TIFF format is simple. A plain text is very simple. Um, whether you can actually read a disc, a uh, classical diskette, three and a half inch diskette in, in a few years or even now is, uh, I mean, whose laptop has a CD drive anymore or, or DVD drive? Yeah? Um, so these are problems, but the formats and moving them forward is something that the archives and libraries do. Um, and if needed, there will be changes in formats and I'm pretty sure they will be needed at some point. Yeah, at Open, I would say checking whether the data is up to date. I mean, it, it's mostly monitored through the angle of data quality. So probably when the data are out of date, it's because they don't match the quality criteria that is now required by the by the service. So, um, so I would say the approach to data updates is, is, is still very manual in the sense that, you know, if a, if a partner has updated their data, then they contact us and we update the data. So it could be that, yeah, the version they have on their side is slightly different from what we have on our side. But I would say for our users, that is not so much of a problem. When it, when it becomes a problem is then when it impacts the quality. And for example, one of the biggest problems at Yopana is the, the uh, persistence of the links. So Yopana, um, we do have metadata, and in the metadata, we have a link to the digital object. Yopana is, um, is not hosting the digital object. So what is happening is indeed, if that links to the digital object uh, breaks, then that means the user can't access to any to nothing. So for those type of things, we have put in place more um, yeah, regular procedures. So every week we are checking um, sample of links and then we have to go back to the institution to, to, to have them working on, a, on, a, on those type of changes. Where the problem is a bit bigger is uh, when you look at the principle of linked data. So for example, Yopana is, is relying a lot now on, on, um, um, on um, 
link data vocabulary. So in the data, we have a lot of links to other resources such as Wikidata, uh, the Getty uh, vocabulary, and, and those services, they are changing. And the fact that because Europeana is using those vocabulary to get more data, so we are also indexing those data. So that means if the data are changing on, on Wikidata, for example, we will not get the fresher version unless we do a full re-index of our old database. So in fact, this is, we don't have so much flexibility with that. So the only, uh, the only way we, we, we have at the moment to do this refresh is indeed we do a full re-index at least once a year. Uh, so we re-index the whole Yopana database and then, yeah, that means at that stage we got uh, fresher data. But it's true that when you start relying on, on resources that are managed elsewhere. This issue of synchronization, freshness is, is really becoming a problem because yeah, um, at the moment, yeah, we feel like we are not fully flexible on, on how we can handle that and, and doing those bulk operations such as re-indexing the full database. We know it's, not, it's really not the ideal uh, situation. It's a lot of work. It exposes yourself. I mean, you are exposing yourself to a lot of risk as well of data corruption, etc. So yeah, at the moment, we, yeah, this is still a problem uh, and an issue. And we will continue to be. I think we won't get rid of that. <laughs> yeah, this isn't something that's set to change tomorrow, unfortunately. Um, any reactions before we move on to the, the big S word, sustainability? There's a question in the chat, um, which is when you have a data from small publishers, do you have a mechanism for users PPV or user micropayments to the publisher? Or is there a plan to develop such a service? Why are you hiding? <laughs> I don't want to have it. <laughs> uh, can I call a friend? Uh, <laughs> no, uh, so far. So first of all, uh, forgive me because I'm, I'm still pretty new in, in the position, so I don't know all the technical details, but so far I, I don't think we have that kind of mechanism. Uh, what we are doing now is that we are trying to help the small publisher uh, to become sustainable, so I'm trying to make the transition towards uh, the, the next question from Ed. Uh, and uh, yeah, th this is what we are working on, but we don't have any mechanism for, for small payment yet, but uh, the governance and the sustainability is a question that is currently being discussed within the triple project. And uh, yeah, we have a meeting uh, in two weeks from now uh, about that. So if people want to send me uh, indication or a hint, I'm happy to look into it. I tried to get out. Uh, yeah, no, good, well good, good work on, on a very tricky question. And also, really, a big thanks to Yannick, who's standing in for Suzanne Dumouchel, um, who was called to higher functions. Um, so really, uh, thank you so much for, for coming in. Um, but I think it is important to move on to the sustainability question. And then we can come to the question from the audience, perhaps afterwards, if there's time. Um, because sustainability is important. We, have, we as a, a European community, as governments, have invested an awful lot of time and energy into these platforms. Uh, they become pillars of success and research practices for researchers. How do we ensure that they're going to be here? How do your platforms ensure that you will be around um, in the short, medium, and long term? Yeah, maybe starting from, again, from the archive library perspective, I think these institutions are generally assumed to be around for some time. But that's not always the case, right? Because there is funding uh, that still needs it because it is expensive work and it needs to be funded. But that is ultimately why we're building, um, for instance, Eric's. They're here to sustain things beyond the project. And that starts with the, in a way, simpler things like the catalogs that are domain specific for us, uh, the SESTA catalog, the VLO in Clarence case, and so on. Um, as the specific services that these infrastructures offer. And uh, 
I think I'll, I'll leave to Mate to, to explain how we're doing it, but uh, the ARIGs are, as uh, Ed already pointed out, uh, Sister Clarin and Daria are joining forces to sustain, for instance, the marketplace and to come up with a combined funding model for this. Yeah, well, yeah, as you said, so I think the, the research infrastructures are for me the, the guarant of, of uh, because they are there after the project and they are here to stay, so to say. Um, and what I like especially, and okay, well, funding may, may also end, we don't know, but what I like uh, as it's also a sustainability argument uh, about the, the research infrastructures is, is they are a network. And, and uh, I already saw it in practice as a, uh, that the, the resilience of the network, so to say. If one node falls out because, for example, one national funding uh, disease, uh, ended, uh, then somebody else can take over. So this coordination or this group of uh, like-minded uh, with similar capabilities and exchanging and coordinating uh, can more easily uh, sustain a uh, some damage so to say uh, than a single than a single actor so yeah the res resilience of the networks is for me the uh, the key here well and and maybe one more uh, another aspect on the sustainability is obviously uh, the is the service being used uh, so, as long as there are users, there will be somebody, uh, I guess, who will to, to pay for it, to be, to be willing to pay for it, right? So, that would be the, uh, the institutions of those users, or, or, uh, but, but it makes no sense to sustain a service that nobody is using. So, the usage is the key for me, one of the keys. Sustainability for EOSC and the EOSC portals, this really boils down to the minimum viable EOSC, which I believe was um, specified in the Tin Man, the Iron Lady documents, or maybe wrong. But anyway, uh, we know what the minimum viable EOSC is. What are those services that are absolutely critical for the EOSC to actually work? Uh, obviously, this includes the, the portal itself, the providers, port, uh, providers um, portal, um, other services like the help desk. If there's no help desk, uh, then can we really have an EOSC? Probably not. But there are also services that may surprise you. Uh, mailing lists for the internal coordination of delivering these services. Um, uh, a wiki. Um, a service management system, how can you provide central core services without ensuring that they are delivered in a proper manner? We need all of these services. One thing we are doing within EOSC Future is working with the Commission to actually say what is the effort required in order to deliver all of these services. Uh, this boils down to a capacity management plan specifying the number of people required, uh, how much resiliency is required. This feeds into the plan for the Commission after EOSC Future on a uh, procurement basis uh, approach to actually fund the ongoing delivery of these services. So, yeah, we are um, worrying about this. We are working at it. So, Operas is one of the latest uh, SSH actors, so we have just made it to the, to the S3 uh, roadmap, and so we are on, on our way to become an ERIC, so we are not yet an ERIC. And as I briefly mentioned in my uh, presentation, uh, the Go Triple platform is one of the core services uh, of Operas. So, definitely, it is in our plan to sustain that service for the next decades. Uh, and it is part of our building uh, as becoming an ERIC. So uh, as uh, uh, Karsten said, uh, that the ERIC is also one of the tools to ensure long-term sustainability of the different services. And as Matej said, as long as they are used and, and useful. So. Yeah, I mean, in the case of Europeana, I think so far what, I, what has made us sustainable is, is factors that have been already mentioned. So. Indeed, uh, about having users, you know, really uh, having the, the servicing being used and, and also having the network around it. So I think what is really the heart of Europeana is really its network. You know, it's, it's really a, a sector coming together and, 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 and facing um, um, the, the challenges of digital technologies together. So I think uh, should the platform disappear, I think the network will still 
very much be there and, and working together. So this is important. And then lastly, I mean, you mentioned it for, for EOSC. I think it's, uh, it's also about funding models. So Europeana has benefited from a, from a yeah, procurement um, uh, funding model, which has allowed the service to, to continue to, to develop. Um, also, we benefited from the other model, which is now there are, there are um, other call for projects, which have as, a, as an objective to also have their services integrated in the core platform. So this is also a model, if you have a project that develop a piece of technologies, that one of the requirements is as part of the project that technology should be integrated within a bigger platform, which is likely to, to sustain it instead of producing tools that at the end of the project are, not go, are, are just going to, to die. So in a way, this mechanism where yeah, you have projects that support the development of, of things that needs to be integrated in, in, a, in a bigger platform is also a model that is working quite well, I think. And, uh, and yeah, this is what Yopana, the way Yopana works now for two years because we have those generic services project that have contributed a lot of building blocks to the platform and could be also a model for, for you, for, for, for EOSC and, uh, and Shock. All right, excellent. Thank you so much. If there are not any more quick questions, because we're approaching the end of the hour, and the next session is lunch, just the most say, important. Yeah, sorry, just you made a good point with the value if we have users that gives value, it will be sustainable. And one of the things that I'm missing is key performance indicators about how many users all the services in the EOC marketplace, in the shock marketplace we have. So do you have figures about how many users and the difference to the researchers that you're making? Thank you. So I, I, I'm not answering neither for the the SSH uh, open marketplace or for EOSC. But assessing the number of users is a very tricky uh, exercise. Uh, first of all, because it's, it's very easy to identify individual users. But how do you identify a platform, for example, connecting to your service? Uh, I'm speaking in the term of EOSC. So how many users are behind that platform that is accessing your service? How, how much do you count them? Do any of them access your service individually as well? So, and you know, it's, it, it, it's, it's a very difficult exercise. So uh, I'm, I'm not sure if, if there are figures to, to give you. Uh, you. You didn't cite me, so I'm happy not to give any figures. Uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, th this, this is something that is not as easy as it looks like, if, if you want to give uh, accurate figures. It just I, I, I know that it's, it's difficult, but in a way you have the control. So it's also like, for, and it's what Yopana did. So it's important to define those KPIs and, we, and you know, like as you are working with them, you might discover that in fact, yeah, it was not the right things to measure. So because you, you have this control, you can define what it means for you to have users. So I think it's, it's a good tool to play with to kind of get a better understanding of your service, what you are providing. So I know it's difficult to, to define it, but you, you, you have the control of this and you can play with that, which I find it quite, uh, quite interesting. No, d definitely you need to have KPI and you have to measure uh, the usage uh, of your services as well as, as other criteria. But what I mean, it's, it's pretty hard just to give a figure now in, uh, yep. <laughs> on, on the platform. So it's, it's slightly more complex than, than that. So this, this is what I wanted, but I agree with you. It's an interesting question for EOSC Portal. It's a difficult one to answer because we do not require um, exclusivity if you um, add your service to the portal, which means that we can add the number of hits to that particular page describing the service. We can um, add the number of people actually ordering it. But that doesn't mean to say that it's not being ordered through other means. So it's very difficult to get the big picture here. So we were mentioned that I think as well, uh, just to quick answer. So I don't have any numbers at my fingertips, but uh, we are collecting the number, well, what, as much as what is possible. So also the direct interaction through uh, um, events uh, and obviously the access to the uh, website. Um, and, but again, with the, with the reservation that uh, this is not the whole truth, but still it is 
gives you some uh, idea and, and uh, we are aware of it and we are, we are collecting those. But I won't give you any numbers yet. I mean, also because we just launched, right? So we, uh, we are a new service, basically. So, yes, we see how, see how it develops. develops. Maybe just a la last word to, to conclude that, that question. The, the number of, of real users is probably just a fraction of, of the whole community that could use it. So still there is a lot of room for improvement, for communication, for dissemination of the services. And uh, as I said uh, uh, in the beginning, uh, we, we need to discuss with people who may not naturally be digital. And they need to learn that this functionalities of this new tool is available for them to, to use it. And it, it's not automatically uh, a black or white action. So you don't need to become all digital or not digital at all. So, but uh, also in some communities you have kind of uh, super user that are using tools and services for the whole community. And so that don't makes the number big, but the impact is, is, is huge. So that's it. And I see Ed waving, so. No, I, I just wanted to conclude by saying that KPIs are very important. Obviously, we are bound to give them by various funding agencies, but they also are, are sometimes not fully available. I mean, think in the process of the marketplace, whether it be the SSH or EOSC, if I, as someone that is an engineer that helps other researchers use this resource to find a tool and then teach it to 20 other researchers, you get the one hit from the tracking website and you don't see the 20 different researchers that I helped. And you don't see the person that talked to their researcher friend who found out through it. So I think we have to, when possible, push back against a sort of only qualitative method of measuring the impact that we have because what we do, and I think as humanities scholars we know very clearly, we are more than just numbers and it is a lot more complicated than a, than a series of figures on a page. America? Oh, it's open? Oh, so in addition to what Matteo already mentioned, I mean, during, uh, now the marketplace launched, but during the project, uh, Shock has, uh, with all its uh, partners and all its, its people in the project, engaged um, users and stakeholders in over 100 events, training events, dissemination events, and they engaged over 5,000 people in those events. So maybe that's an addition to what your, your answer was. Thanks. Thank you. All right, I think we can end the panel. Thank you so much to our panelists. Um, really fantastic job, fantastic conversation. Thank you to the audience both in Brussels and online. And bon appétit.